question and thank you everyone who's made it out tonight to listen to us talk about gardening um, native plants in Santa Fe and specifically the pollinator habitat kit plants. Um, today I'll be presenting um, this webinar on how to uh, guidance for plantings and protecting pollinators specific to the Santa Fe pollinator habitat kits. And after the presentation, we will have a question and answer segment featuring Linda Churchill, who is the head gardener for the Santa Fe Botanical Garden and has many years of experience gardening with native plants in the Santa Fe area. And also Mike Halverson, who is the manager of the Santa Ana Native Plant Nursery, where all of these plants for the habitat kits were grown. So he's very familiar with the kits and he also has years of experience gardening with native plants in the region. So I'm really excited to have them join us and share their extensive native plant knowledge on gardening in the area and share what, what we can learn from these habitat kits. So without further ado, I will go ahead and start. Um, first, I will give you a brief outline of what I'll be talking about. I'll give a quick introduction of the Xerces Society and pollinator conservation and um, talk about the Santa Fe Pollinator Trail and Habitat Kit Program description. Then the bulk of the webinar will be talking about basics of native plant gardening in Santa Fe and species specific guidance for all of those individual species in the habitat kits. And finally, I'll talk a little bit more about other species you can add to your habitat and your yard and more pollinator friendly gardening practices to consider. So let's uh, talk a little bit about the Xerces Society. If you aren't familiar with us, we are an international organization dedicated to the conservation of invertebrates and their habitat. And we have staff in regional offices throughout the United States, including Santa Fe. A lot of our work is dedicated to insects like bees, butterflies, fireflies, and dragonflies, but also other invertebrates like uh, snails or freshwater mussels, which are all animals without a backbone or a spine. Um, invertebrates make up 94% of species on Earth, and they play crucial roles for the function of our planet including things like pollination, as well as seed dispersal, decomposition, and they make up a major base of the food web, feeding many other wildlife species. And if you're wondering why we're called the Xerces Society, we are named after this little blue butterfly on the left here. That is a Xerces blue butterfly. It was a butterfly species only found in sand dune habitats of the San Francisco Bay Area. And the destruction of those dunes led to the extinction of this butterfly species. So in naming ourselves Xerces, we're honoring that name and dedicating our work to uh, conserve pollinators and insects through po programs, including pollinator conservation, endangered species conservation, as well as a pesticide program and communication and outreach program. So in order to conserve pollinators, we need to understand who they are and what they need to survive. So pollinators are a particularly important group of insects because they are necessary for the reproduction of 80% of our flowering plants. Most, most plants require an animal to move pollen from one flower to another in order to successfully reproduce. And pollinators include some insects that you're probably familiar with as pollinators like bees, butterflies, and moths, but also several other insects like wasps, beetles, and flies. And bees are in particular are a very important pollinating insect. That's because they collect pollen on their body and carry it to their nest to feed to their babies. And because they are covered in pollen all the time, moving it between flowers to flower. They're really, really excellent and efficient at pollinating flowers. Um, bees in the United States, there are nearly 3,600 species in the US alone. And New Mexico is home to over a quarter of all of our US B 
bee species. About a thousand species are estimated to be in New Mexico. Um, we also have a really quite large diversity of butterflies, about 800 in, in North America, north of Mexico, about 300 or so in the state of New Mexico, and also a great diversity of moths and uh, wasps, beetles, and flies. So there is a lot of diversity here just across different types of insects. On top of that, these insects have lots of different preferences based on their life cycles. Some are active only in spring or only in summer or fall. Some are active all year long. And uh, based on their feeding strategies and what habitats they live in, those um, species require different flowers to feed on and help pollinate. So understanding this large diversity of pollinators can help us understand how to provide habitat for them. So specifically, I'm going to talk about pollinator habitat in the form of food. What do these pollinators need to eat? And that's what our habitat kits provide, our floral resources where those pollinators can feed on nectar and pollen from those wildflowers we're providing in those habitat kits. So to support a diversity of pollinators, we need to um, provide a diversity of flowering plants. And there's a few uh, key rules to providing for our native pollinators. Specifically, providing native plants um, are best for feeding our native pollinators because they have evolved in the same area of, with our native pollinators. They are adapted, a lot of our pollinators are adapted or even specialized to feeding on those native plants, whereas plants from other parts of the world haven't evolved with our native pollinators of the region and may not be as suitable for feeding those um, native pollinators. Another key element in providing that food for pollinators, a diversity of pollinators, is providing continuous blooms throughout the year. So you want uh, blooms available for bees, butterflies, everything to visit as soon as uh, the winter is over and pollinators are becoming active again. So early in the spring when our queen bees are coming out of hibernation, our queen bumblebees come out of hibernation in early spring and need resources in order to start a colony. There are also other bees and butterflies that are active at very specific times of year, maybe only in fall or only in spring. And providing those blooms throughout the year supports all of those specialized life cycles of a diversity of pollinators. Also including a variety of plant families with different flower colors and flower shapes really help support our specialist pollinator species that uh, really rely on a very specific plant family or plant genus. We have a lot of bee species in New Mexico. Almost half of our bee species are specialist, which means they will only collect pollen from a certain plant family or a certain plant genus to feed to their babies. So they are critical for pollination of those plant species and they rely on them to uh, complete their reproductive process. So thinking about all of these elements you need to consider when you're creating pollinator habitat, it can kind of be a little overwhelming to develop a whole pollinator garden by yourself with all of these things to consider, the diversity, the blooms across seasons. And in order to encourage and support the creation of high quality pollinator habitat in Santa Fe, we are offering free pollinator plants the habitat kits to residents and organizations of Santa Fe who have committed to planting and maintaining these plants on their properties in Santa Fe. And basically these kits are like a, a starter kit for a pollinator garden. The, all of the plant species in them are selected for pollinator attractiveness, spring to fall blooms. They include a diversity of plant families. They're also, um, approved by folks like Linda and Mike as being easy to grow in the greenhouse, but also easy for people to grow um, in their gardens in Santa Fe and in, in our high desert ecosystems. So these plants are 
all selected for our climate and they are also pesticide free thanks to Santa Ana native plant nursery practices. And we have two kit types, the low to medium water kit and the, and the low water kit. The low water kit's on top here, low to medium water is on bottom. And we'll have a total of 350 kits distributed to residents and organizations this weekend. So that's exciting that that is coming up. And I just wanna take a moment to um, highlight the practices of the Santa Ana Native Plant Nursery, which grew these plants. Um, this nursery is owned and operated by the Pueblo of Santa Ana and specializes in producing native and drought tolerant plants of the Colorado Plateau and Desert Southwest. Um, most of the species in the kits are from locally collected seeds. So these plants are really well adapted to our desert ecosystems in Santa Fe. And they are also free of pesticides. And that means they are safe for pollinators to feed from. So some producers might use pesticides in their production process. And some of those pesticides will linger until um, a few weeks, even up to a couple of years after being treated. So knowing that these plants do not have any pesticide toxicity to pollinators, that is um, a really important thing to keep in mind when you're creating habitat for pollinators. Another major aspect of the Habitat Kit program is to provide guidance on planting and maintaining the plants in the Habitat Kits. Um, providing the plants themselves is, is one big step in helping people get the materials they need, but also helping folks know how to plant and when to plant and educate kit recipients about other ways they can help conserve pollinators is another big part of this program. So first we have our planting guidance document, which I uh, have a lot of thanks to Linda Churchill for helping me refine this. Um, this document was sent to all kit recipients and it's also on our website, xerces.org. And it has some pretty generalized guidance on planting, soil amendments, weeding, herb herbivore, rabbit proofing your plantings, things like that. So um, this document is online and it's been shared with everyone. It also features several links to other really great resources, including plant list, um, overwintering and nesting habitat guidance, lots of really great fact sheets. So check out this document in detail if you can, so you can find those links to resources. This will be printed and handed out to kit recipients this weekend as well. Um, and then our other big uh, planting guidance piece is this webinar. So this webinar will have a lot more detail in planting and uh, maintain, maintenance of these habitat kits compared to this little four page document. So without further ado, let's talk about how um, we can plan for these plants. So first I'll be going over some basic guidance of native plant gardening. And I just kind of want to start with a disclaimer that gardening is an experiment. And while we would like to see most of all of these plants survive, there will probably inevitably be some, uh, a few loss of plant lives here. And all gardeners have killed a few plants and that's how you become a better gardener. So fortunately, these plants are very hardy and able to withstand a little bit of um, abuse and tolerate some really uh, rough conditions. But those for, since they're coming to you as such small plants, they will need quite a bit of TLC in the first two years. So considering this, um, a lot of our guidance and advice in the um, in this webinar and in the document are kind of generalized and you can adapt care for these plants based on your location and your resource, resources. So considering um, individual plants have different genetics, your planting location is unique. So what works for one person's garden compared to yours may be a little different. 
So for instance, if your planting site has really hard pan soil, it's very compacted and hard, you may want to dig a larger hole than what our guide recommends and augment it with a little compost and sand to give your young plants a better start in life. So just be aware that observing what your site has to offer and that you can observe and adapt based on how your plants are doing. So first, I want to talk a little bit about planting locations and thinking about um, if, you, if you do want to plant in multiple areas of your yard, identifying those microclimates in your planting area. So consider that one part of your yard is much hotter and drier, potentially based on sun exposure and when that sun exposure is the time of day. So morning sun is a lot less harsh than our afternoon sun. Um, thinking about how your south or west facing side of your house or wall might be a lot warmer than versus the north or east facing that does get that morning sun compared to hot afternoon sun. And also thinking about where water collects on your property. So slopes and contours determine where water is more available. If you have low areas that collect a lot of water, avoid planting things that don't like to be wet, like your cacti. And if you have areas that are a little lower or where you have more water to collect, if you get the low to medium water kit, think about planting the medium water species there, like the showy milkweed and the bee balm. And then also other places that might um, really help these little plants and getting that extra water and, and reducing your water use is um, thinking about where it's running off from either your roof or um, off of the sidewalk. So a few photos here, I have um, the north side of my house with the canale where there's um, water running off the roof and you can just see it's pretty lush there. Lots of native asters have um, flourished there. It doesn't get any harsh afternoon sun, but it is mostly in full sun the rest of the day. It's a really nice location for our more sensitive medium water species, whereas things like this chocolate flower on the side of a road in gravel right next to a rock wall, it's just getting super hot there, but that's what it likes. And it's also um, kind of at the base of a little slope there, so it is collecting a little more water there. So that's just really happy where it's at. And then on the very bottom, I have um, upright prairie cone, cone flower and the rail trail, the paved rail trail there has a nice slope down to that cone flower and it's getting a little bit more water than other places. So thinking about how even the heat from um, your driveways and any kind of rock impervious surfaces will um, heat up some of those plants that like it and that might be a good place for them, but other plants may, may not want to be there. So thinking about that in microclimates in your locations. Next is weed management. So weeds will um, be, your, be your enemy for a while, potentially, if you have a lot of seed source around your area. Um, once you've identified where you'd like to plant, be sure to manage those weeds so you're not fighting them constantly. You might still fight them constantly, but um, think about how you can remove them and prevent competition with your newly planted plants. Um, to help you recognize a lot of common weeds, uh, the Pajarito Environmental Education Center has a really excellent weed ID guide on their website if you want to check that out. Um, and removing those weeds, especially the ones that are really well rooted or have really abundant seeds, um, you'll want to remove those before they go to seed and prevent that source from coming back year after year. And one thing to consider is including a really heavy mulch over your planting area to reduce that weed cover. It can kind of help um, prevent those from coming up and getting the sunlight they need to germinate. But be sure not to suffocate your newly planted plants with mulch because they're so small. You wanna keep at least four inches away or so from those plants from being covered in mulch. Once your plants are a little bigger, you can mulch them up to the base, but just be careful not to 
accidentally confuse them for weeds or cover them up with that mulch. Soil amendment. So this is uh, another big question I have a lot of. Um, can I add organic material? What compost should I add? Should I add manure? For these native plants, most of them do not want any organic material added. Um, and this, this will be based on, on your site if you've had just the most sterile, disturbed soil for a very long time, adding a tiny bit of compost and sand might be helpful. But for the most part, adding the organic material is not necessary for these native plants. A couple exceptions include showy milkweed and bee balm and the low to medium water kit. They will respond well to some added organic material. And another thing to think of um, with our soil is how well drained your, your soil is. So if you have extremely compacted clay soil, um, adding a bit of sand or grit to help improve drainage will keep your plants from getting too waterlogged. So um, if your soil is extremely compacted, um, dig larger holes for your plants and backfill with that same soil. Um, if, if, you're, if you're like my yard, um, one way to help break up that soil is to fill them up with water and let that infiltrate through the soil and you can kind of dig that out a little bit better. Um, so yes, consider uh, breaking up your really compacted soil maybe adding some sand to improve that soil drainage as well. Next, um, for irrigation, most of the species will do well with drip irrigation. That slow, steady drip will prevent a lot of plant stress from under and overwatering. but there are some exceptions, of course. There always are in ecology. So um, prickly pear doesn't need to be on drip, the blackfoot daisy and the threadleaf brown cell are all things that um, are pretty sensitive to overwatering and you can leave them off of drip and try to hand water them less frequently um, than, than drip irrigation uh, waters. Um, soaker hoses are another good option if you can't install irrigation. Um, just be sure to place the holes down on soaker hoses so they're not spraying water up into the air to evaporate. And also hand watering is okay if you can't not everyone can afford irrigation. So just be careful when you are hand watering, not to overwater and water deeply, which takes a little bit of time by hand. So one thing that you can do to help your hand watering is to create a sl small soil ber berm around your plants and fill that up with water and let it infiltrate. Um, so it's not spreading out away from your plant. So on watering schedule, um, after planting is pretty crucial time for watering. So you wanna keep your soil moist for the first month or so in the ground, except for the cacti, those can dry out a little bit more. Um, during the second month, you wanna slowly start tapering the water off to a less frequent schedule as it gets colder down to every two weeks or so. And then finally, in winter, water every three to four weeks, unless we have quite a bit of snow. Um, don't water if your ground is frozen or if it's less than 20 degrees out. And don't worry about watering cacti in winter. And next year, for the full first season of plant growth, most plants need to be irrigated deeply one to two times a week. And this is a very general, watering schedule and you can observe and adjust based on where you've planted. If it's extremely hot and dry, you might need to increase this watering schedule. If you get it, if you're planting in a really wet area, then you won't need to um, water as often. So just consider that, um, you know, adjusting based on what, what your plants are telling you. So what are your plants telling you though? Um, signs of an overwatered plant. This is my example of my poor gardening decision this spring. Um, what an overwatered plant can look like is the plant fails to grow, the plant is pale or yellowish in color, the plant is limp and lacks vigor, and watering fails to make the plant perk up by, say, the next day. So this top plant of mine is a desert mule ear. And I planted it in a very um, clayey 
poorly drained area and I hand watered it too much and just destroyed it. Um, one of them survived, it, it didn't mind my abuse, but um, that is an example of watering uh, too frequently and especially based on your soil. Um, if, you, if it's not draining, then you can really see some overwatered plant damage pretty quickly. Signs of an underwatered plant. So um, what first is plant fails to grow. Plant may be yellowish or have brown leaves or leaf edges, which is not typical in an overwatered plant. The plant lacks bigger. Leaves or stems may be brittle and break off. So that's what you're seeing here with this chocolate flower that I forgot to water. Um, and then watering can help that plant perk up, especially if the damage isn't gone too far. So if you do water and you see it to become more yellow, then that's probably overwatering. If it, if you do see those leaves perk up, then uh, you're probably have a little bit of an underwatering issue. So some other things to keep in mind with watering. Um, most of the plant species in these kits are more sensitive to overwatering than underwatering. So um, in general, you can uh, caution to water less versus water more. Um, that is dependent on your site. Um, deep watering every few days is preferable to frequent light watering that will encourage the roots to grow much deeper and reach those uh, harder to reach water reserves in the soil. And watering frequency can also influence growth rate and flowering frequency with many of our plant species. So a few species will bloom um, early in spring and then after monsoon season. So if they do get a little supplemental water, they might bloom a little more. This next year, I wouldn't, I wouldn't count on it, um, but in future years when they're a little more established and have some have some robustness to flower, then um, that extra watering can potentially improve your growth and flowering frequency for some species. Um, next, I just wanna mention when you are watering these plants, please consider water conservation, um, maintain your irrigation system, check for leaks. Um, the city of Santa Fe has a few watering rules that includes no watering between 10 and 6 p.m between May 1st and October 31st. So water early and or water late. Um, recommended not to water more than three times per week by the city of Santa Fe. So if you can do the deep watering um, two to three times a, a week, that's preferred. Um, the conservation office also offers rainwater harvest and irrigation rebates if you go to SaveWaterSantaFe.com, you can learn more about those rebates. Next, mulching. So mulching our plants has a lot of benefits, including weed control, water conservation, and moderating soil temperatures. It also can help protect and aid in the cycling of nutrients and of oxygen and nitrogen. And that only works if there's no barrier. So things like plastic, weed barrier, um, avoid using that where you're planting native plants because that will keep the soil from cycling nutrients. Um, consider using some chipped or shredded tree bark or wood, decomposed sawdust, pesticide-free grass clippings or straw, and weed-free grass clippings or straw. Um, and then a few plants, specifically on that gravel note, um, gravel does make a garden and city hotter. So use that as a mulch with caution. It, um, some, some of those heat loving plants will like it, but if possible, using organic um, plant material compost is preferred. And again, keep that mulch a little ways away from your small seedlings so you don't smother them. So it's, it's winters around the corner, it's coming for us. So thinking about freeze protection of your new tiny plants, don't worry too much if it looks like your new plants get frosted. The roots are the most important part and the soil stays warm well into the fall. So once fall temperatures are colder and you notice the tops of some of your plants will die back considerably, things like the desert four o'clock will just disappear, but the roots, are still there and will continue to grow throughout fall and some of winter. 
So make sure you clearly mark where your plants are so you don't lose them the next year because they might disappear entirely. And considering when we might have a light frost of 28 to 32 degrees, if that happens within two weeks of planting, you may want to cover them with cardboard boxes or light blankets. And for a hard freeze, which is 27 degrees or lower, um, cover them within four weeks of your planting date. So remove the covers um, either way once the temperature has increased in the morning. So after that four week date, your plant should be acclimated pretty well to withstand these colder temperatures. And the roots of the plants are protected by that soil again and are actively growing. Also, a lot of us are, have some issues with rabbits and deer in our yards and gardens. And um, these tiny little plants don't quite have the chemical defenses that make them um, less palatable to those herbivores that like to munch on plants. So that tender new growth is really irresistible to some uh, deer and rabbits. And one thing you can do to prevent that is plant in an area inaccessible to those rabbits or deer if you're lucky enough to, to be able to fence them out. Otherwise, you can cover individual plants with chicken wire like you see here. Um, and once those, a lot of those species, once they get a little bigger and are able to incorporate um, some more chemical defenses in their plant leaves, then the rabbits and deer will leave them alone. Once they're a little more robust and have those defenses built up in their plant tissues. Um, for other herbicides, specifically insects that might, or for other herbivores, specifically insects that might be munching on your plants, please do not use pesticides on these plants. They are meant for feeding pollinators, and that includes caterpillars, which become butterflies and moths, which pollinate our plants. And they're also feeding all the other pollinators with the pollen and nectar in their flowers. So think, thinking about pesticides, that includes herbicides, which will kill the plants. Um, also insecticides, fungicides can really influence the um, gut bacteria of our native pollinators, so avoid using those at all. And organic products does not mean they are not toxic. So even if you're if what you've used in the past is organic and it's it's not uh, dangerous in in most situations, it um, can still cause death to pollinators. So please consider that when you're looking at any pest on these plants, removing them physically is the ideal way to do it. And we'll also be sharing a um, fact sheet, the Smarter Pest Management Protecting Pollinators at Home document, which is in that planting guidance. Um, there's a link to it in that document as well. Next um, is planting locations, determining where you will plant each plant, and considering the spacing for those species. So some of these, they are so small, and it's hard to imagine they could get four feet by four feet, but some of them can. So considering making sure each individual plant has space or however big they will get, that is in your planting guidance document, the maximum size for those plants. Also, when you go to dig, dig a little bit deeper than the container and three, two to three times as wide as the plant's container and dig even deeper if the soil is very compacted and backfill with that same soil. So when you're planting, the um, base of the plant is level with the surrounding soil. And think about adding some sand to your planting hole to improve drainage if needed. So um, before you plant, uh, water the plants in their containers and also water the hole you're about to place them in and let that uh, infiltrate into the soil. Make sure you can really get some water down um, in that soil before planting. Remove the plants from their little containers and the, if they're root bound, if there's a lot of roots all tangled together, break them up with your hands so that those roots are able to move out into the soil. 
um, place the plant in the hole, keeping the base of the plant at the same level as the surrounding soil. Don't put it too deep. Um, and then use extra soil if you want to create a small berm around the plant to help capture and hold water. And once it's in the ground, water it again and keep that soil moist for about a month after planting these very small, tiny plants, except for the, except for the cacti, that one can dry out a little bit, but you'll, since they're coming fresh from the greenhouse and fresh from these little containers, you'll wanna keep them moist for um, that first month after planting. So finally, I can go on to our species specific guidance, the low water kit species. Um, most of them will thrive in very hot, dry areas, but they still need that water, but low water does not mean no water. So um, especially in that first two years of establishment, they will, they will need some uh, TLC and some watering attention. Um, these kits include things with yellow, red to white blooms, and it also includes the prickly pear. So when you do go to plant these, consider um, the spines on those, the tiny little spines, the glochids, and use tongs if, if you have them when you're planting. So the first plant in the kit is the Forestieria pubescens, a New Mexico olive. Um, it is our early spring blooming species in this kit. So it has very small yellow early spring blooms and the female plants produce fruit that birds eat. So we don't know which, which ones we have. They're all grown from seed. So you might get a male, you might get a female and the females will produce fruit. If you're worried about that fruit landing on uh, sidewalks or on your porch or something, maybe place that um, a little ways away. Um, these can be really large brushy shrubs or they can be pruned into a small tree shape and they get about 12 to 15 feet tall and up to 12 feet wide um, if they're not pruned. And these typically prefer kind of lower flatter areas for planting, but they also can really do well in a large container if you have one and would prefer to plant them that way. Next in the kit is our pale evening primrose, Enothera pallida. These have really delicate white flowers that bloom in late spring and summer, and they can bloom again after monsoon season. They attract lots of different specialist bees and moths, including hummingbird moths. Um, they are low growing, so this is a species that you might want to plant kind of in the front of a bed or near a walkway so they're easy to see. And they do really well in full sun and well-drained soils and like a little bit of heat. Next is the Plains Prickly Pear, Opuntia polycantha. These have usually yellow flowers. Sometimes they can have a little variation, but um, they're blooming in early summer and visited regularly by a variety of specialist cactus bees. So you'll see um, lots of cactus bees enjoying these flowers. And these are pretty low growing, about 10 inches tall, but they can spread. Um, so consider putting them in an area where they have a little bit of room to, to spread out. And um, also does best in full sun and well-drained soils. And this is, this is our species that has very, very low water needs. So consider that as your selecting a planting location and as you're planning your watering. Um, a note on pests, these can get um, coccineal scale, which is a little white fuzzy um, pest. You'll see it on, on cacti around town, but it's uh, a little white fuzzy protective coating around an insect. And these are best removed by a forceful stream of water or scraping off manually. Next is Retibida columnifera, the upright prairie coneflower. Um, we have an assortment of red or yellow or both flowers, um, and these will bloom pretty early in the summer until pretty late in the summer. So uh, you'll, you'll have a variety of bees visiting them um, throughout the year. And they're typically a little shorter, but can get up to one to three feet tall by two feet wide and um, they can tolerate pretty heavier clay soils, but um, they are a little 
on the short-lived side, but they reseed really easily. So once those um, flower heads are completely dry and have like almost no color to them, the petals are gone, that's when the seeds are ready and will probably reseed on their own too. Next is the horsetail milkweed. This has white flowers in summer attracting all kinds of pollinators, bees, butterflies, moths, wasps, beetles, flies, and they're also food for monarch caterpillars. So this is um, a species you see throughout town and it's kind of considered weedy and not, it's not the showiest milkweed, which is in our other habitat kit, but it is definitely um, a preferred monarch food for monarchs in New Mexico. It can get up to two feet tall by two feet wide, but it can spread by rhizomes if there is a lot of water available. So just consider that if you want a lot, maybe plant it in a lower area that collects water. If you don't, plant it um, somewhere where it's not going to spread because of lots of extra water. And it is toxic, so consider that when you're planting your, in your location based on if you're worried about pets or children eating them. Um, the milkweed also will get milkweed aphids. And they're these little tiny orange aphids and plants are usually not harmed, but the aphids can be removed by a stream of water or wiped off with a paper towel. Um, the aphids also, also feed ladybugs. So just uh, if you like, if you don't mind them on your milkweeds, you can observe and watch the ladybugs eat them. Those aphids won't go to many other plants in your yard. They'll just be attracted to the milkweed. Next is the Blackfoot daisy, Melampodium lycanthemum. It's a little small white daisy flower that blooms in summer. It's pretty low growing, so another one you might wanna plant closer to a walkway. Um, up to 10 inches or eight inches tall, two feet wide, and can form a dense little mound. And it really prefers well-drained soils and hot, dry conditions. So this is something that's pretty sensitive to overwatering. So um, irrigation is not recommended for this plant. Next is chocolate flower, Berlandiera lyrata. It is a summer blooming yellow flower with an amazing chocolate scent. It can get up to 12 to 18 inches tall by two feet wide. And it again um, prefers really well-drained soils and hot, dry conditions. And it can reseed pretty well in gravel too. Next is Scabrethia scabra, the desert mule's ear. This is a late summer blooming yellow flower. Um, the mature plant can get pretty big, so up to two feet tall by four feet wide, and it prefers well-drained rocky sandy soils and hotter dry conditions. And it looks great all winter, the entire plant and stems, leaves, flowers, they all turn white and is pretty quite striking. Very cool plant. Next is Senecio flaccidus, the threadleaf ground cell. It is our late blooming uh, species in the low water kit. It's late summer to fall blooming with yellow flowers and silvery gray foliage, up to three feet tall, two feet wide, often not three feet tall, um, but it'll kind of often flop over too. But you can head it back to encourage more, a more dense growing habit. And this one in particular is another to be careful with overwatering. It does like full sun and well-drained soils and not too much water. So finally moving on to the low to medium water kit. Um, most of the species in this kit will thrive in low to medium moisture. We have plants with yellow, purple, pink, white blooms. And Specifically with this kit, we have one species that did not germinate well, so it could be substituted out with a couple other species, which are Palmer Penstemon and Desert Forklock. So the first species is three-leaf sumac, Rus trilobata. It's our early spring blooming shrub in this kit, attracts many bees, and typically has a really nice red foliage in fall and it can get up to five to seven feet tall and it can get really wide, like about 12 feet wide and can form a very dense shrub. Um, and you can kind of control that uh, growth rate with the amount of water it gets. 
Um, it does like full sun in most soil conditions, and it is a pretty low water shrub as well. It does well on slopes if you have a good slope to plant it on. Next is our kind of earlier summer bloomier, Rocky Mountain Penstemon, Penstemon strictus, kind of late spring blooms into summer with stalks of purple flowers with deep green foliage. Flower stalks up to two feet tall, but the base of the plant stays pretty low um, and not too wide. Um, it will do well in full sun and most soil conditions and can tolerate a little bit more water if you have a wetter spot you'd like to add. You might get this species, but you might also get Pinstemon palmeri and Mirabilis multiflora. So let's look at those. So Palmer Pinstemon, another Pinstemon, um, similar to Rocky Mountain Pinstemon, but it has pink flowers and really light green um, foliage. And the flower stalks can get a lot taller than the Rocky Mountain Pinstemon. They're typically three feet tall, but they can get up to six feet tall and they can spread pretty wide that base of the plant. So consider that when you're spacing it out. Um, like most penstemons, if you clip back the flower stems right after flowering, the plant will look better and live a little longer. If you want the plant to recede, let the stems stay in place, let the seed ripen, and then either let the seed scatter or collect it when the seed pods are dry and scatter wherever you prefer um, in winter. Um, another full sun, well-drained soil, and this one's a little more low water than the uh, Rocky Mountain Penstemon. It can tolerate less water than that one. And then the other alternate species for Rocky Mountain Penstemon is Desert Four O'Clock. So this plant has summer blooms of purple pink flowers with really lush foliage. It attracts uh, hummingbird moths and it can get up to two feet tall by three feet wide. And if it has water, it will spread even more. So it can make a really excellent groundwater and tolerates a little bit of shade and really does well in low water situations. Um, one thing to keep in mind in winter, it will drop all above ground leaves and stems in fall, but continue to water that taproot because it is um, still, going, still going strong. Next is the showy milkweed, Asclepia speciosa. This has large clusters of pink and purple blooms throughout summer that attract many insect pollinators and provides food for monarch caterpillars again. This is actually a um, milkweed moth caterpillar, so not just monarchs eat on it. Um, it can get up to two to three feet tall and three feet wide, but it will also spread with excess water. And it needs medium water to establish, but it can um, tolerate drought after becoming well established and this responds well to some organic material in the soil. And another thing to note, this one can get milkweed aphids too. Um, if, they're, if they're really destroying the plant, you can uh, remove them easily with a paper towel or, or let them go. Next is white prairie clover. This it has white blooms and blooms throughout summer, attracting lots of different pollinators. It can get up to two feet tall by two feet wide, and the flower stalks may spread out horizontally, and it can tolerate most soils and is another low water species. It it's, um, may not live super long if it's overwatered frequently. Another in the low to medium water kit is our Heterotheca velosa, hairy false golden aster. This has little yellow flowers from summer into autumn, attracting bees and butterflies. It can get up to two feet tall by two feet wide, tolerates most soils, and is also another one of our more low water versus low to medium water species in this kit. This is one of our more uh, medium water species, the bee balm, Monarda fistulosa. It has purple flowers in summer, attracting lots of different pollinators up to one to three feet tall by one feet wide, but it can spread if it's in a wet area. Um, needs medium water to establish and tolerates most soils and responds well to organic matter. 
and also consider planting in an area with good air circulation to prevent powdery mildew from really taking over. Um, it, this one does get powdery mildew pretty easily. It won't kill the plant, but it might be unsightly if you don't like it. Um, the round seed heads in winter also look really nice as well. Next is uh, Kota Hopi Tea Green Thread. It's uh, late spring to early fall blooming. It's just blooming constantly most of the time. And you'll see it throughout town. It has small yellow flowers with thinner th thread-like foliage. And it can get up to three feet tall by one feet wide and prefers well-drained soils, one of our low water species in this kit. Next is Verbena McDougalli or McDougal Verbena. This is a summer to early fall blooming Verbena with slender stalks of small purple flowers, two to three feet tall, one feet wide, and it likes full sun and most soils, and it's on the more medium water side. So if you do have a wetter spot, this will, this will prefer it. And finally, we have Gallardia pulchella blanket flower. It's a summer to fall blooming plant with red and yellow flowers, attracting lots of different species, um, up to two feet tall by one to two feet wide. It's short lived typically, but it will reseed very easily. And it does prefer full sun in most soils and will tolerate some medium water, but may not live as long. So I finally covers all the species you could receive in either the low water or low to medium water kit. These species make up a great combination of native pollinator friendly plants, but there are plenty of other species you can purchase or encourage to grow in your yard if you'd like to create even more habitat. So I'd like to highlight our pollinator plants list. It's a Xerces produced plant list for the Albuquerque Santa Fe region. There's um, an assortment of things that are in the kits that are listed here, but also many other species. If you want to include some different annuals or more shrubs, that is included in this list and it's linked in the planting guidance document. Another really great list I wanted to highlight is the native plant list by the Santa Fe Native Plant Project. Um, this includes just about every <laughs> native plant you might be able to find to plant in your yard commercially that are commercially available. And um, I just highlighted a few species here that are, I think, really, really great additions to a pollinator garden in Santa Fe. And there are more pollinator plant lists for New Mexico, but I wanted to highlight these Santa Fe sp specific list. So, Another plant that may not come to mind as a pollinator food source are native grasses. And they, while they don't have flowers that are technically pollinator attractive, they do create uh, overwintering habitat and their host plants for a lot of native butterfly species. Um, bumblebees will nest under big bunch grasses that have little holes under them. They're really great overwintering habitat. So our native grass, bunch grasses like um, blue grama and side oats grama, buffalo grass, all of those things and many others are a great addition to a pollinator garden. And when you're thinking about purchasing plants, a couple of things to keep in mind are to buy, be safe, be sure to talk to your um, nursery manager, whoever's producing the plants, about if they have been treated with pesticides, what kind of pesticides have they been treated with. Um, seek out organic plants when you can. And another is to buy native locally sourced plants. So those native plants are going to usually host a lot more native pollinator species and they'll be more adapted to our climate in Santa Fe. And another thing to note is what nesting and overwintering habitat you could create. So um, thinking about leaving stems for stem nesting bees, leaving leaf litter for overwintering sites and nutrient cycling, creating rock piles for overwintering and nesting sites. And this uh, fact sheet goes over in detail everything you'd want to know. It's also listed in the planting guidance document and will be handed out at the kit distribution. 
Um, it does recommend creating brush piles and in the Southwest, one thing to consider about creating that is considering defensible space. If you do um, have a very, if you, it might cause a fire hazard, so being sure that um, you can uh, easily put that out or keep it away from other things that might um, be fragile to uh, ignite ignition. Oh. So finally, I just want to say you can go to xerces.org and find a lot more resources on gardening and native plant um, resources and how to protect pollinators in your yard. And finally, I really want to acknowledge a lot of our supporters in this project, the Carol Petrie Foundation, all of our Santa Fe Pollinator Trail partners, our Xerces Society members, and special thanks to our partners at the Santa Fe Botanical Garden, Linda Churchill and Christina Salvador, and the Santa Ana Native Plant Nursery, Mike Halverson and Katie Zikafus. Also the Santa Fe Master Gardeners with the Santa Fe Native Plant Project, Pam Wolf specifically, thank you for helping me with distribution and so many others. So thanks guys. Now, finally, we can get on to the question and answer and uh, see what questions you have for Linda and Mike. I'll help answer any pollinator habitat questions, but they, they are the go-to experts for our uh, native plant gardening questions. So with that, I would love to see um, any questions you all might have. Start throwing them in the Q&A. Uh, please let me know. Uh, if you if you don't want to ask questions now, you can also email me at caitlin.hossi at xerces.org at the bottom there. But yes, please ask questions while we have Mike and Linda at our at our disposal. <laughs> hey Mike. Hi. Ooh, first question. Amanda asks, should we harden the plants before planting? So I know, um, Mike, may, maybe you can talk about that. <laughs> yes, um, hardening off is definitely a must because they're going to be coming right directly out of the greenhouse. And so, you know, if you have an area like a portal or something that's going to be shady that you can keep your plants under for, you know, a couple of days, that would be ideal. Um, don't you don't have to put them completely under where they're going to get deep shade, but just enough shade to where you know they'll get some sun in the morning and afternoon shade. But I, I'd say a couple of days would be ideal, and then you should be able to go from there. Great, and they a couple some kits. If you're picking up on Sunday, they'll probably have hardened off for um, Friday night and Saturday night at the fairgrounds, so they will be kept outside. So there okay. might be if you're picking up. Sunday, then you've probably had enough hardening off time there. That's yeah, um, not great. Cool. And next one, how much sun is necessary for full sun? Do, do either of you have a preference for taking that one? I could try that. Um, full sun, rule of thumb usually means about six hours a day, at least for minimum. So I'd say if you can get something that's in that much sun, six to, six to eight hours a day in summer, and at least a half a day sun in the winter is good. A lot of these plants do have sort of a basal rosette or something that's still green in the winter. And a lot of those plants still have a little bit of photosynthesis going on in the winter. So half a day sun, you know, four hours in the winter and six plus hours um, in the summer is good. More is better. Great, thanks Linda. That's a very good clarification to make. Um, Next is, can I overwater my desert four o'clock plants? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, with the desert four o'clock, to get it started, I would water on a drip twice a week, no more than that. And that should really encourage the, the four o'clock to grow. Um, you know, and then, of course, I always encourage drip as much as possible. I'm not a huge fan of soaker hoses, but they do work. Um, spray is, in my opinion, is a big no-no just for the fact that it's going to just waste too much water. But, you know, when I, when I drip, say, if I put a four o'clock on a drip, I would put one gallon an hour emitter and I would run it at least 45 minutes to an hour each time I water. And that should get you a good amount of moisture into that soil. And you want to water longer rather than infrequent. You don't want to water five or 10 minutes because that's just um, not going to get your roots down as deep as you want. 
Um, for from Sue, is a soaker hose acceptable irrigation for low water kit plants? It can be. Um, my 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 thoughts on soaker hoses because I've used them a lot in the past is you really want to if you're going to use them you want to replace them every year because they will just wear out with our our hot hot sun I mean if, unless you put them under mulch then you know if the mulch mulch will help but it won't stop the things from drying out the the soaker hose from drying out but ideally if you can use a drip that's going to be much better than a soaker hose. The other thing is with um, these little plants, they're only going to have, you know, root areas that are this big or so. And soaker hoses are better for watering a broad area, broad and deep if you run it long enough. And for little tiny plants, their roots aren't out and broad yet. They're just very specific areas. And it's, it would almost be better to hand water if you can't drip irrigate for the new plants than to try to get it with a soaker hose. I think you'll end up wasting water if you put a soaker down and try to get each little plant that, you know, one's plant is two feet away from the next one. Um, it's probably better to hand water and maybe when the plants are more established and their roots are out, you know, in broader areas, then to change to a soaker hose. It just doesn't seem like a very efficient way to water tiny plants at first. Thanks, that's, that's very good information to have. We would definitely wanna conserve water as much as we can. Um, so another question, if plants get too big over time, is there a resource for dividing them? She is new to uh, these native plants and I'm sure that's species dependent. Maybe Linda, if you wanna take that one. That's a tough one. You, you might need to dig around, excuse the pun, to find out a little more information on these specifics, you know, each individual species. A lot of these species have deep tap roots or just going to be really hard to divide. You wouldn't want to divide like a, a desert four o'clock because they have a really deep tap root that goes down forever. And there's just no way to divide it um, <laughs> that I would know of. Um, it, it's probably better to do a little research ahead of time to find out how big the plant will get and space it accordingly. If you're talking about plants you already have in your garden, it's probably worth finding out what that root structure looks like. Some can be divided. A lot of them are going to be really touchy about that, not only because of the root structure, but because they're just, they're made to be in the ground for a long time and they just won't take well to transplanting. Some will be fine. A lot of them won't be. <laughs> Sorry, but find out more about what kind of plant you have, and what it looks like on the ground before trying. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, that's definitely key is knowing that yeah. Most of these species are, aren't are easily divided because of their big tap roots. And if you want to learn more, definitely dig a little deeper into um, learning the structures of them. Um, and, and maybe just to prevent that, spacing them out so that you, you don't run into that problem. Right. Um, Maria asked, my major issue with pests are gophers. Any suggestions on what to do about them? I failed to trap, kill, or remove them. So I don't know. Either of you are welcome to take that one. Gophers are tough. Um, you know, I mean, some people say try using juicy fruit, but you know, again, I'm not a huge fan of that. Um, but yeah, just gophers are tough. Um, you know, when you plant a plant that has like, a, 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 let's say a I don't want to say a perfume, but like um, a strong smell when you when you cut the, the branch off. Well, like, okay, for instance, the three leaf sumac, that one has a strong smell when you when you trim on it, whether it's the roots or even the, the branch. That smell tends to deter some of your you know your rodents like gophers and, and moles and stuff like that. But some of the others, you know, that's going to be a tough one to answer. <laughs> you almost have to exclude them from. If you know you have them, you might have to get rid of them from that area, then exclude them from coming back in. Like putting in, I've heard of people putting in like underground fencing that's three feet deep before planting in an area. That's the, the only way to get rid of them is to keep them out essentially. Uh, and I think three foot deep, like hardware cloth around an, a garden area will probably keep them from digging towards your plants. Or, you know, a, a cat that will go after them or something, but if you have them and they're regular, you might just have to get on a regular trapping program 
I don't really believe in using poison because that's more likely going to kill. You're going to have collateral damage with poison. It's not good for the environment. They, they, once you know how to trap gophers, they're not too hard to trap. They're kind of stupid, but, but you have to know how to do it or have a lot of money to shell out with somebody else that will do it. The good thing about trapping is it's, it's not very kind to the gopher, but you could, at least you get to see a dead body and you know you got it. And there's the solitary animals. So there's usually only one in a den before the next one moves in next year. Sorry, bad news. <laughs> a good information. Yeah, good, good realistic thoughts. And maybe maybe a badger will move in. That's uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> Optimistic. <laughs> um, Alex asked if I chose to plant the desert olive in a container, should you start with a smaller container and move to larger as it grows, or could you start it in a large container? I have started mine in all kinds of containers. Um, you know, so like say I took a, you know the one gallon, which is going to be about twelve inches tall, and I put it in a fifteen gallon container. In two years, it's pretty big, um, so it's not going to not going to be a problem. Um, if you took a one gallon and you put it into like, say, a five gallon container within a year, a year and a half, you're going to have to, you know, a pot anyway. So it's not a bad idea to go ahead and put it into a bigger container just to start. That's, you know, just my opinion. Oh, one the thing too, also about the New Mexico olive is um, you can grow them. However, I have grown them as bonsai and they turn out really cool. You can, you know, can shape them however you want. It, you can, you know, especially if you get the, you know, like the female and hopefully, you know, the people that want the females get the females can't guarantee that. But, you know, when you have a trained New Mexico olive, that that berry on there is just really cool in the fall. So. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, it's, it's really cool what you've done with the New Mexico olives at the nursery. They're, they're pretty cool. Um, all right, next, how much sand should I add to extremely compacted clay? And should I use a rototiller? What, uh, I don't know if either of you have strong opinions about uh, rototillers or exactly how much sand, um, but yeah, I see you nodding, Linda. I'd love to hear your, your thoughts. Rototillers, especially in clay, you'll probably end up dunking up the rototiller before you get much of it turned. <laughs> I did that a lot when I was a child. It doesn't work very well. Um, you also will end up bringing up weed seed more likely than not, and then you'll be planting a bunch of the weed seed that you just tilled up from the soil. So I would say no on the rototiller. Um, for sure, dig a much bigger hole than you would normally if you're planting in you know that loamy topsoil that doesn't exist in New Mexico. Um, so dig a big hole. You can amend it with, um, you can use other lighter things if you don't have sand. Sand's usually pretty available in Arroyos, but you can just use soil from somebody else's garden if you have a friend that's got something that's not clay. Um, but the most important thing is to just break up that clay. A lot of these plants actually will do just fine in clay if they're not over water. Um, you know, our, our, they're native plants and that's one of our native soil types. You just want to make sure that you don't overwater the plant too much. Breaking up the clay so that the roots can get out into it is a good thing. And then adding some sand will help keep it from, you know, tensing back up again, the soil, the, the clay. So just make sure you don't overwater it. And I would say for, you can help me out with this, Mike, I'd say for one small plant in a big hole, maybe, something like a couple cups worth of sand in there um, would help keep the mix yeah. from freezing up too much. Yeah, and mix it really, really well. You know, don't have clumps of clay and then clumps of sand. You want to mix it, you know, like you would a really good, you know, tortilla mix or something, you know, right. so it's all completely mixed you know, really well. Great. Yeah, that's why I went wrong with my desert mule's ear that I killed. I planted it in clay and probably overwatered it because it's not getting drained up. So um, yeah, thanks for, thanks for sharing that. And then last question, if anyone has any more, please throw them in the Q&A. Is it possible to wait until October 6th to plant the low water kit? I would say probably yes, um, as long as they're hardened off. You know, don't keep them in your garage. You know, don't necessarily, don't keep them in your house to where they're gonna, stay warm. Um, you want to keep
keep them kind of on the outside. That way they can they can freeze a little bit. And all these plants in this small container can freeze to an extent. You just don't want them to get too cold. But yeah, I, I would I would say you could probably hold off until October, but the sooner the better, just to be on the safe side. Great. Thanks, Mary. And we got it. We got a couple more. If you don't mind sticking around a little past seven. Um, Marilyn asked, how do I know if I have clay soil? And I can send Marilyn some more resources on, on figuring that out, but I'd love to hear your guys' immediate answer. Pick up a handful of soil and squeeze it. Well, if it's a little bit damp, squeeze it. And then if it keeps the shape of your hand without moving, that's clay soil. It or kind it of falls like apart with something else. Sorry, Mike? Or if it feels like Play-Doh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, if it feels like clay, if you've ever worked with clay before, um, and there's, you know, different easy um, tests you can do to figure out about what your your soil is um, on clay, sand, and loam, um, and I can share. I've I've chatted with Marilyn a bit and can help her figure that out. Um, Brian asked, "Is there value to using the larger grain sand from my mini ant hills?" I guess in adding, uh, improving uh, um, drainage. I would go for it. Yeah, um, you know, probably the larger, you know, coarser sand, probably the better. Be careful of the ants. Those are probably harvester ants, and they don't like it when people get into their <laughs> mounds. Yeah, I, I agree. I think uh, adding or avoiding, avoiding angering ants, but also, hey, if it's there, why not? <laughs> um, Pamela just mentioned that CSU extension suggest organic matter is preferable to sand when amending clay soil. Have you guys um, had a lot of experience adding organic matter in, in Santa Fe specifically? That's what I'm really curious about is that organic matter. Um, I would typically sure. add organic matter myself before adding sand uh, because it breaks down slowly over time and adds a little bit to the soils. It's just that some of the plants on this list may not do as well with organic matter, but that's few. I, I read over the list carefully. I think most would be okay with that. And so my recommendation would be, unless it's one of those plants that we said really doesn't want very much water at all, like the cactuses and the um, Senecio, the threadleaf groundsel, et cetera, I would tend to want to add maybe some coarse bark mulch or um, compost that's not really, really fine, um, because then you, you won't get any of the, the, the gravelly nature of what you need to break up the clay soil. So that's another option. You could add that with the sand or add it instead of the sand. If you add both and you get sort of two good things breaking up the clay a little bit. You can also, if you have, like I do where I don't have caliche on my hillsides here, I have sand in my arroyos. Um, organic also helps sort of hold the sand together a little better. So it makes also a better planted pocket. So organic matter adds a lot. You just don't want to make your soil where you're planting for most of these natives too rich, because that's also not so good for the plants. So. Great, thanks, Linda. I'm learning so much. <laughs> this is really, really helpful. Um, another question, is there some way to tell from the soil moisture level in the soil if I am overwatering, or will I only know when the plant starts to look sad? So, how do you guys test your soil hmm. moisture? Linda, did you want to take this one on, or you want, did you want me to talk a little bit? Once you get to start. Okay. Um, so sometimes, you know, like if your finger, if your uh, soil is not too compacted, you can do the finger test. You know, that just means take your, you know, and that's this is what we do in the nursery. So we take our finger, we put it in the pot, or you can do this in the soil, and you know, feel down, feel how far that moisture goes. Um, if it feels wet and you, you know it's sticking to your finger pretty good, then your soil's probably staying, um, you know, pretty moist. The other option is like a, you know, take a, a chopstick or you know a, a dowel or something like that, kind of shove it into the soil and you know just kind of leave it in there for a second or two, or maybe more, and then pull it out and see 
you know, is there, you know, what does it feel like? Is it still pretty dry when you pull it out? Is it really wet? Because, you know, like a wood product or a bamboo product, it will absorb that moisture. So that can kind of tell you, you know, where your moisture is. And if it's pretty wet, you'll, you'll tell with that, you know, with the, the dowel. That's pretty much what I do. I try to step my finger in the soil. I'm not sure otherwise. I'll take one more question. I know it's a, it's a little over time, so I want to make sure you guys have an, have an evening to yourselves. Um, so Alex asked, how thick do you recommend for mulch if it is tree trimmings? I hear very thick, too, but then have heard that can hinder airflow. And this is an area that gets a lot of mid-afternoon sun. Any thoughts on mulch thickness based on tree trimmings? Um, if it's chopped or ground up tree trimmings, um, if, if you're, what you're trying to do is keep the moisture in the ground and prevent weeds, uh, four inches minimum is what you want for doing that. But you don't want four inches or six inches that are right up close to tiny plants. I mean, that's what you would use under shrubs and trees typically, or, or overall in the bed of where you have natives or perennials planted. You don't want that much mulch up to a smaller plant. So you pull it away, you know, around the crown or around the small area where your small plant is planted. So that would generally keep the weeds down and generally keep the soil moisture, you know, it's the, it's the moisture level higher in your soil. What you want to do right up close to a small plant that you're just planting is probably nothing at all for the first month or two. You might want to, you know, as the winter goes on and you want to protect the plant a little bit more, maybe some finer mulch, you know, maybe even some mulch purchase because that's a little finer quality um, and coarseness um, up closer to the, you know, closer to the plant itself, but even so you don't want it touching the plant first year. You know, you don't want mice getting, finding their way to the plant. You don't want any kind of fungus or anything getting to the plant. So I would say for the first year, nothing within an inch or two of the plant itself. So, I would agree. Linda, do you have any thoughts, Mike? Sorry. No, I, I think I totally agree with Linda. I think that's a great idea. You know, not too thick around the, the young plants and then, you know, go thicker away from the plants. But yeah, no, I totally agree with that. All right. Well, I'm going to cut off questions and let you guys get on with your evening. I really, really appreciate you joining us. I've yeah, lots of lots of answers or questions answered based on planting for Santa Fe. It's a it's definitely a more challenging place to garden and having you all share your experiences is super helpful. So thank you Wait, again. Can I get a plug real quick here for the botanical yeah. garden? Um, the botanical garden has already planted some plants courtesy of Santa Ana in uh, Xerxes Society. We planted um, a, a sort of a half kit, half of one, half of the other kit in late May. And you can come see those anytime, but especially we're doing a community day when you can, anybody can come in free to the Botanical Gardens on, I believe it's Sunday, September 19th. You can come in, Caitlin's gonna be there. We're gonna have a, t a table full of all kinds of information about this. You can see the plants in the kit. You're gonna have received your kits by then. But you, you can ask all kinds of questions of any of us. We've got books, we've got speakers, and we have the plants already planted in the ground. So any questions you don't have answered yet, bring them. We can talk to you about them all day. So please come on over. <laughs> Thanks so much, Linda. I'll definitely email that information to all of our kit recipients too. So yeah, excited to, to be there for community day. And yeah, if... Uh, you all have any any other things to add, feel free. I can also share other information you think is really important to, with the Habitat Kit recipients, but uh, thanks so much for tonight. And if you have um, any questions for me, feel free to email me at caitlin.hussey at xerces.org. And thanks, Mike and Linda, you're the best. Appreciate you coming. I do want to talk real quick yeah. about um, the cactus, you know, like, several people are probably going to go, hey, how am I going to handle these cactus? I don't know if any of you can see these or or these, these tweezers, 
Um, long, non, long nose needle nose pliers also work really well for getting the cactus out of the pot and putting them into the soil. You know, as long as you don't squeeze the plant too much. Most of the time, I use the the, the tweezers to hold the pot and then just kind of dump the cactus out. So, just wanted to share that so people aren't too worried about you know working with the cactus. <laughs> Uh, yes, thank you, Mike, for pointing that out, because I, uh, no one wants to have a bunch of little glow kids in their skin and <laughs> dealing with that for, for weeks, so, um, yeah, thanks again, and yeah, thank you all for coming tonight, for watching, this will be uploaded to the Xerces YouTube channel, thanks to Rachel for doing that, and if there's anything else, feel free to email me, and thanks again for coming tonight. Thank you, Caitlin. Thanks, Mike. <laughs>